Okay, well, welcome everybody um, <clears throat> to our conference on geometric analysis uh, to celebrate uh, Yusuf Dojuk's uh, many contributions <laughs> both to mathematics and uh, to the Graduate Center and to City University of New York and to math <coughs> mathematicians at large. Um, I met him uh, a long time ago when I was a graduate student. Um, he was visiting Stony Brook at the time in 1986. And um, there was, a, so I think you taught a, an advanced course, is that right? Yeah. You taught an advanced course, and, and uh, I didn't take that course, I didn't know you at the time, but there was a rumor running around in the department among the grad students that there's this really wonderful um, <laughs> CUNY faculty member that's visiting, <laughs> and he knows a lot of math, and he talks to the graduate students. <laughs> and uh, uh, it wasn't that much longer after that that I, was, I would go to tea a lot, and, and, and I met him. And uh, I just remember drawing pairs of pants for him over and over again <laughs> during that semester. And, and that's how our relationship started. And then, uh, you know, we, over the years, he was uh, uh, like a mentor to me. We, I would come by the Graduate Center a lot. He was one of my mentors. I, there were a lot of people that sort of contributed along the way, but he certainly had a lot to do with me sort of having this uh, 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 point of view about mathematics and, and teaching me about how mathematics is uh, not just about, uh, not just about uh, uh, pumping out papers or, or such things. And uh, uh, as the years have gone on, um, Lo and behold, I've sort of now known him in just about every capacity it's possible to know him. I was, knew him as a student, I knew him as a junior faculty member, uh, then a colleague at CUNY, and now I'm his boss. <laughs> <laughs> and through all of that, usually when you have a relationship like this with someone at these various, there's got to be some hiccup or something along the way or some, no. He's just been constantly wonderful. <laughs> and um, so, and I think I'm not the only one that feels that way, judging by the way we've, um, uh, we've seen the reaction for the, this conference. So uh, before I have Radek, Radek is gonna introduce Dennis, um, just a few logistical things. Um, there, let's see, there's a couple of things. There's gonna be a coffee break. All the coffee breaks uh, are in the commons room. Okay, and if you haven't registered already, please register in the Commons room. And um, uh, the banquet is at 6.30 p.m. at the Persian Grill. If you're coming, it's cold cash. We're taking cash and only cash. <laughs> and uh, Rob Landsman is collecting the money. <laughs> so please make sure you let him know. I have, I have to call Musa very soon and tell him a number. So let me know in the next few hours what, what you're doing, whether you're coming or, uh, uh, or let Rob Landsman know. Where is the bro? It's on 30th Street. Um, if you just walk down Fifth Avenue down to 30th Street, make a left, it's on that street. But we'll, you know, I'll, okay. I'll draw a map later. Um, Let's see, um, any other logistical things? I think that's all I need to say now, so I'll turn it over to Radek. Thank you, and uh, it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, who is Dennis Sullivan from the Graduate Center at Stony Brook University, and he will speak about combinatorial hydrodynamics in 3D. Here's such an elaborate. <laughs> uh, so, I have one remark about Joseph that is in the mathematics part of the talk. So, but uh, it occurred to me during that last discussion there that uh, human thing. Uh, once Joseph came out, tell me Joseph, done okay? <laughs> uh, came out to visit. Uh, my home in Stony Brook, and uh, found out something about myself. I already knew it about him, but he came in, he was looking around, and then he saw a part of the house that looks out on the, that after a house or two, on, on the water, and he was going to walk there and look at it. And he said, may I go to that part of the house? <laughs> and But not, not quite that awkwardly, but I realized Gee, I'm 
not as nearly as well managed as Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> I learned about myself, but it's very nice the way he did it. I saw a whole new level, new level of, of gentility that I he revealed to me in that moment. Okay, just thought of that as you were talking. Uh, so, so, um, see, about ten years after I came here. Um, I got, well, I, in that 10 year, first 10 years, I learned about Joseph uh, working at Beacon. And there's this neat thing that a lot of us know about on the line that if you, if you put down a lattice of points and then you jump with equal probability one way or the other and study the probability of that, then this is organized by the Laplacian in analysis. That, Brownian motion, heat kernel, all that is all intertwined. And it all is revealed very nicely by the combinatorial approximation of, this, of the second derivative by the second difference. You reinterpret that from this. And, uh, and then <clears throat> it's not obvious if you have an analogous thing works in, in R2 and R3, where you have grid points. And it's not obvious. Uh, Alice thing on the general manifold. It's not obvious what the corresponding theorem is about um, the higher dimensional uh, algebraic topology and the differential forms. And jo Joseph proved that. <coughs> to, 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 I start calling it Dadio. Dadio right? <laughs> proved that uh, combinatorial descriptions, which make sense, which I'm going to use later in the talk, uh, for the Laplacian actually convert the eigenvalues. I can think of all that converge to the continuum one. So, so then I learned that during the first period here, and then um, about ten years later, in the early '90s, I got interested. I found out that this uh, this equation that you hear about all the time that describe fluids in three dimensions uh, were not known to have solutions. And I found that surprising. They're used all over the place to make models. <laughs> We're going to talk about a model today. And um, I wondered why uh, that problem was so difficult. I mean, the answer for why it's so difficult is that the information that you need to keep studying the equation involves being in a fairly smooth space, and you only know you're in a much rougher space from the algebra of the equation. So there's a gap between what you need to know, and a definite gap, and what you what you would like to, what you need to know to continue the evolution process by the equation. And, um, and that's where it stood uh, for a long time. So um, I was thinking maybe one could get some insight into some of this by doing a combinatorial version of, of the, um, of that, PDE, just like the heat equations, combinatorial version gave all that insight. And, uh, and <clears throat> well, there's been a long thought process. I'm talking about thinking about this off and on since the early 90s. So, um, just going to kind of report on um, some of the <clears throat> more recent attempts to understand this. So um, it's going to be elementary, and please ask questions. Try to keep me honest. <laughs> so, so first thing I'll say. So <clears throat> there's there's kind of a, an initial there's a, there's a sort of difficulty that's not present in that heat kernel thing is that this equation has a term has terms in it which are like products. Those products are, 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 the, are the problem. So I wanted to illustrate that just uh, these points are kind of close together. Just like grid, set of grid points on a line. And say we have some function on the line, and then we're going to go to the plane and tree space. And, we, and, and then you, you want to talk about the derivative. You have some function on the line that you're going to approximate it by restricting it to those grid points. And then we're going to find a derivative by, say, f of k 
f of k plus 1 minus f of k, let's say divided by h, <coughs> is the, um, so we take that difference quotient, that's going to be an approximation for the derivative. So this PDE has got derivatives in it, and we have products. Okay, so this is going to be what the derivative is. And this will be, I'll call this PF at k. So I'm going to decide to place this information. So if you're here, the derivative, proper derivative, you compare the value here to the value here, divide by h, and you place the value there. Okay, you have to make that decision. There are kind of three decisions you can try here. Then, uh, then it turns out uh, you want to apply this to products. Does anyone know what the answer is? <laughs> Well, in fact, let's see if it satisfies the usual rule, df times g minus f times dg. So that would be zero in ordinary calculus, right? You get it right? And it's not zero, it's actually equal to this, h, this is an h here, mm -hmm. times df times dg. That. If you use black, it would be more visible. What? If you use black, it would be more visible. Okay. Where's the black? Uh, I think there's one over that. I think there's one over that way. Yeah. There's, there's one, one in the red. No, there's black thing. There's black. There's in the, the black. bag, the back one is a black one. You got two markers this in front of you. This is black? Looks black. It's purple top. Oh, it's purple. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, so let me try to, uh, so let's just, let's think of the values, let's just give names for the value, this half is too much, so, so it sort of looks, so this, this thing here is like sort of A, A, B prime minus A, B, that's, that's this top part here. For FG, okay, uh, over H, and then I have minus. Uh, somebody help me. What's that one? <laughs> uh, a prime minus A times B times B right over H right. Minus a, a yeah, minus yeah, minus a, a times b prime minus b, b prime minus b over h, over h, and then this is supposed to be equal to h times. You're missing one over h. After first equality, what? Well, what's, what's wrong? No, there there should be wrong. 1 over h squared because no, you have the difference. I copied this down here. I copied this down here. And this down here. Right. I'm just copying it down. You guys are reading it. So now we write this down. So we have a prime minus a in parentheses. And it's a prime minus a. Yeah, over h. Over h. And b prime minus b over h. Yeah, that's the age school. Right. So that, that works, right? Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay, not bad. Theorem and proof. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see that often from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, already I could just stop here. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, in thinking, I mean, what is this algebraic structure? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an operator. You have a ring. Community brain, got an operator satisfying this. We can talk about that. So yeah. somehow the we did the analog of that from about the early nineties to uh, recently. And then you can put in three functions, expand this out. Mm -hmm. Use this rule, you'd have an FF prime all the way through, and then you 
expands this out again, and then you get some other identities. And then you put four functions, your big algebraic structure. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but anyway, it illustrates the kind of difficulty that if you, if you just sort of put down a grid and put calculus on it in the different sense, then the nonlinear, the products are going to create some mm -hmm. extra terms. Right? So, it won't just go through automatically. So the Dothik's problem was a linear problem, and he had other things to worry about. Okay. So okay. So I want to. Uh, so I'm going to just sort of go through the few steps of what we call sort of lattice uh, hydrodynamics. So we're going to use, um, I was an undergraduate chemist, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to use the body-centered cubic lattice, okay? <laughs> yeah. So you put down lattice point, well let's just put down the cubical lattice points, I'm just going to do it in the plane first. And then you put down, mm -hmm. in the middle of each cube, you put a something like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, now, something nice here is actually that if you drew your original cubic lattice, remember that, that's the cubic lattice, right? That's the first set of points I put down. I could draw more. And then you put these other points, you see they're also Mm -hmm. They're also uh, part of the cubic lattice. Mm -hmm. So the extra points you added are actually the vertices of what we call the dual mm -hmm. cubical decomposition, where each line here is good to have color. <clears throat> so let's say these dual ones purple. Yeah. There, um, this has always intrigued me since I was a graduate student. The, the uh, dual thing is always transversal to the black thing, the original thing. All the pieces, all the purple pieces are transversal. If they have too small dimension, they're disjoint. And if they have big enough dimension that they intersect, they intersect like transversal subspaces in a vector space. So this body centered cubic lattice is really two lattices, uh, two, uh, so it has some kind of duality. So, so BCC, body centered cubic lattice, has some duality in it. Because it's the union of the thing and its dual. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have something, a cheap way to get duality in something is take the thing and its dual thing and put them together, mm -hmm. and then you and this duality. Um, so we're going to do this in, in three space. It's harder to draw a picture. <laughs> I'll just put some as duality. We'll discuss that. Stannis, so is there some obvious reason the chemists are interested in this? Yeah, yeah. What is, what's uh, well, not from 50x years ago, <laughs> undergraduate, do I remember this, but I remember the name. In fact, they talked a little more about face center cubic. But yeah. Body center cubic is like if you have some species of consisting of two things that are sort of, I think sodium chloride doesn't work, but cesium chloride works apparently. They're approximately the same atomic size. You put all the all the, thi all the uh, things of one size at one set of lattice and all the things of the other size. And then it's sort of interesting, this distance here, if this is one, quick test, another test, what's that distance there? In decibels. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Uh, In decibels. Rare. I mean, give me a decimal. Don't just rattle off a name or something. 2 over 2.7. What? 0.7 something. 0.7, right. Yeah. 
Square root of two over two. Yeah. Right. One point four over two. So it's point seven oh five. So, yeah. so <laughs> this is actually closer than yeah. these two are closer. Mm -hmm. So the the two species are hugging together mm -hmm. better than their yeah. their fellow friends or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, they coordinate uh, electron bonds. Like this guy, you know, this guy can coordinate, share electrons with four yeah. other guys. You know, four other guys. <laughs> so in, in three space, it'd be eight other guys to right. make coordinations. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so now, uh, where's that piece of paper? This is a lattice. Okay, so we want, I want to express the duality. So, so we're going to use uh, topology to express the duality. We're going to use the subject Christina doesn't like. <laughs> homology. We're going to use homology. <laughs> Sorry. We were arguing about it during our class this morning. I pleaded I was a Karanchi. She likes integral currents, but she doesn't like their homology class. <laughs> You're blushing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we use the no. We're going to use. We're not going to use homology. We're going to use the thing that builds homology, which is. So you you define these spaces. So let's say the black one will be C I is going to be the. You see that when you take this cubical decomposition, you now have points, edges, and faces. Mm -hmm. I call it cubical, but. In three space, you have points, edges, faces, and three-dimensional things. So there's four things right. you can have beside the points. And so we have a, we're going to take the vector space. We're going to do this with some period, so it's just finally many to consider. And we'll take the vector space that's been generated by the zero things, the one thing, the two things, and the three things in three space. So the picture here would be zero, one, and two. And then you have the same thing for the dual lattice. I'll call it di. <clears throat> and I'm going to add them together because they're both present there. I'm just going to form the direct sum. This took me like 15 years to do this. <laughs> because there's a reason why I just wouldn't want to do it. But, and I'm going to give that a name bi. Uh, so that VI is, is the space we're going to work. It's the sum of the two. The thing in its dual. Luis uh, looks puzzled. These are, huh? So the three-dimensional vector spaces. If you're no, if, if I have, I'm going to. These are these are. Uh, oh no! Because these are the vector spaces generated by the dots. That's right. D zero. That's C zero. The right, black okay. dots. The purple dots. Right. D zero. The vector space and generated by, by the, the edge of black okay. edges yeah, yeah, yeah. is D1, C1, one, and the, D1. the purple edges is D1. Yeah, I really, I've got to draw a cube here because I'm thinking cube all the time. Yeah. It's. Right. Yeah, I mean. So I really, and I have four, four, spa four, four C spaces right, and four, and four D, D spaces, spaces so. that I direct someone like this. I mm -hmm. get four V spaces. And then, uh, then there's this nice thing, uh, the dual. Now we put the things in the center too, right. and then we have one over here, and then there'd be this dual, right. one up here. Yeah, so, uh, what's this distance in decimals? <laughs> From the corner of the unit group to the square root of five over two? No, no, the decimals. Oh. Not decimals. <laughs> it's it's also right. irrational. One point two something? Um, no, you don't just guess. <laughs> What's the square root of five? Uh, uh, I do have a phone, it's true, but I was trying to, I was, I was trying to show off and place. do it in my head. <laughs> huh? Well, in a unit crew, what's the distance between the two opposite sides in, in decimals? Huh? Yeah, but in decimals. When I was a kid, I learned 
The square root of three was that's one one square root two. Uh, the same as the square root two one. George Washington's birth. Seventeen thirty-two. So one point seven three two. Okay. So it's one point seven, but this is halfway there. Halfway there. So we have to divide that. So what's that? Point. Point eight. Something. So again, these two are closer than these two. One's one and one's point eight. That's where they could interact. Okay, so now, and then, and then there's, so there's this interesting, this is due to Poincaré, that like this purple face here, which is a two-dimensional basis element here, mm -hmm. D2, is corresponded with this one-dimensional face here, mm -hmm. right, in the black. Oh, here. Okay. So an element in D2 here is corresponds to an element in D1 there. So we have isomorphisms, thanks to Poincaré, between C, I, I'll just go ahead and... I'm, I'm doing this picture now. And and what do I write here now? Three mass I and I. D, I, and C, D, I, yeah. Okay, so we have isomorphisms like that. All the way up and down, four of them, right? Four isomorphisms mm -hmm. like that. If we have zero to three, one to two, two, two to, to one, one right three to zero. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have. So then we get. So this implies isomorphisms like this. <coughs> and it just switches. Right? Okay. So this is the. This is. The dual, let's call this the duality here, and we call it star, denoted S, we call it the star operator. Because it's like, in Ramanian geometry, you have an I form goes to an N minus I form. So we're going to think of these as the combinatorial analog of the I forms, and this is combinatorial analog of the star operator. See, what's been bothering topologists for me and for a lot of people is, the usual way you write Frank Ray duality goes from one space to a different, a different kind of space. So now if you see this mm. great mm -hmm. trick here, and it sort of has natural meaning in this body center cubic lattice. Okay, now there's another funny thing that happens. So let me define, <clears throat> in the 80s there was this field called lattice gauge theory. I guess it still exists. We call it lattice field. We had an example over here. A function, a continuous thing, can be just restricted to the lattice points, and that's a lattice function. Okay, so vector field, you could just restrict it to the lattice points, uh, and you would have a vector at every lattice point. You could have a, a matrix field and restrict it. Anything associated to the tangent bundle of R3 restricted to the lattice points. That's the lattice field. And then, then there's another isomorphism that a lattice vector field, now, now the colors, I need the neutral color too because there may be more colors here. Who's the red or the blue? The green is the only one that's really bad. There's also the blue. I use the blue. Uh, is blue Republican or Democrat? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so lattice vector field. Where I come from, blue is the color of the northern troops. <laughs> uh, lattice vector field corresponds precisely to an element in V of 1. I'm just going to take the vector, so I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to uh, orient, this is, I have a periodic cubic grid of three space. I've got a period like a thousand or something. I have a thousand cubes in each direction. Okay, million, trillion cubes or something. Billion cubes. Uh, and you just take your vector here at any point and 
this one, you take the vector and you just record its x component here, its, y, its no, its z component here, its y component here, and its x component here. And you take your vector here and record uh, its z component here, its y component here, and its x component here. Sorry, Dennis. Yeah. These are all oriented. So I, I, yeah, so I take my usual coordinates, I orient the axes in the usual way. So you usually think of x is going to the right, mm -hmm. z is going up, and let's say y goes back. Do people take y going back or going forward <laughs> classes? Must be some kind of convention. <laughs> it feels natural to me to have it go back. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So then, turns out this is a bijection. Mm -hmm. And there's a more refined notion of this space. I said to take linear combinations of the basis elements, but really to do what I'm going to talk about now, you really have to do the following thing. This took about 35 years from graduate school to understand. <laughs> Steenrod made choices when he explained this to us. You can do it without choices in the following way. You take, your objects are oriented faces and edges. So you have twice as many but then you introduce this relation, a cell and an orientation <coughs> equals minus the same cell with the opposite orientation. Mm -hmm. You just introduce that, now you reduce the dimension back down to what you want, and this, and this is a totally functorial, natural construction with no choices. And every object has an orientation. Okay. <coughs> And so, and then I, this isomorphism is going to use this sort of arbitrary choice. Of, mm -hmm. Things are eights of choices, except that one mm -hmm. goes to V of one. And so, I think of an element V of one now as a function, it's a coefficient on each cell that changes sign if you change mm -hmm. the orientation. It's a coefficient on each oriented cell that changes sign if you change orientation. That's a slight difference. So it's the same vector space as the vector space between oriented cells, but there are two to the, uh, in this case, two to the billion isomorphisms, because you have to choose a sign on each one. There are billion, well, no, three times that, because it's edges. Anyway, this, now it's, so, so this is a this is a bijection. Speed up a little bit. Um, well, let me. That's how I went this way. Let me just say how you go that way. If you see a. Um, yeah, if I. If I, if I, what's an element in the new V of one? It says for each orientation, I have a coefficient. Mm -hmm. So I want to take that coefficient and, uh, well, this this orientation agreed with this the chosen one. So I just take that coefficient uh, and slide it over here. And I put it in, this is the x direction, so I put it here. So that's sort of how you start going back. And then you'll pick up this coefficient from, let's see, the z, if I want to get the z coefficient, I look here mm -hmm. at what the, coefficient, what the coefficient gave me. And if the orientation went like that, I put minus c prime mm here. -hmm. Right there. Hmm? Minus because 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 the I have the sort of preferred orientation which goes with the axes, but when you're calculating with these things, you just get things that are oriented by whatever procedure you're thinking of, and plus coefficients. So, so anyway, if you if you know these coefficients, you can reconstruct the lattice vector. Here. Okay, now. <clears throat> So over here, and then we have lattice scalar fields. We have also scalar fields. And so 
So that would correspond to B of zero, but that's just the tautology. Just the same thing. Um, and then uh, now we have this D operator here. Uh, oh, we can apply D to uh, any lattice field. We just mm -hmm. uh, we have any lattice field, like a ve vector field, we just, and, and now we have three directions. We have three kinds of Ds, because we can do the X direction, and the Y direction, and the Z direction. And then we can just take the vector here, minus the vector here, but we, we're in the Euclidean space, we just slide the vector over. Do you remember, how many of you remember when you learned that you could slide vectors? <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> and put one at the end of the other. <laughs> We can't do that in topology and manifold, but we don't have connections. We don't know how to do that. <laughs> so, I'm still excited by it. Okay. So anyway, so you can find these Ds. And then so and then you can write, <clears throat> you know, you can write, for example, the analog of a gradient of F, and you can write divergence of V. And you can write curl of V. You can write analogs of these. You see, you just take your lattice field. The gradient is what? It's a vector field. That its first entry is the x derivative. Second entry is the y, der y derivative. The third derivative. Third entry is the z derivative. So you can just write down what this means. Right? These are, these are the say the combinatorial ones. Right. And you use D. You use D's in the various directions, x, y, or z. And you can find gradient, divergence is the sum, x derivative x coordinate plus y derivative y coordinate mm -hmm. plus z derivative. And then curls a little more you know, fancy expression. X derivative y coordinate minus y derivative x coordinate plus the component, and there are three other possibilities for the curls. And then, well, what do these go to under this isomorphism? They go to some operators. Well, this one would go from V0 to V1, because this goes from a scalar function to a vector field. Mm -hmm. This one, divergence, goes from V of 1 to V of 0 mm -hmm. under this isomorphism. And then the curl goes to V of 1 to V of 1. Mm. Right? This curl of a vector field of vector fields. Mm -hmm. Vector fields going to be of one. Okay. Can, can anyone guess what I might be putting here? <laughs> what would the gradient of a function correspond to? What would a differential geometer say? Come on, what would a differential geometry? <laughs> We're all different. Huh? What? Fast direction. What? Fast direction to... No. What? Fast direction, quick direction. Maximum. Yeah, maximum. Yeah. Oh, maximum. Oh, yeah. oh, well, no. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what the gradient gives you, right? The, well, the direction of greatest increase, right? So, that's true, but um, that's too smart an answer. I want more... <laughs> Have, you know, dumb answer. <laughs> an obvious answer. The door to DF? Obvious. Yeah. The door to DF? What? Do you want the door vector to DF? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's, there is an operator here, Yeah. which is, well, we call it the co-boundary. Yeah, right, right. Which goes from uh, zero things to one thing. Right. You have a function, D of a function to one form. Right. But, you know, this is the co-boundary. Now, what, what should this the, be? I, the boundary, I guess. Should be the boundary. <laughs> yeah. Now, what should this one be? This is sort of more tricky. Still the field and then take the D. What? Still the field, take the D and undo it. Is that, is that the product of the two? Still the undo it. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Starry star. 
Up to uh, H factor. You gotta, yeah. When you do the formula, you have to put in because this side is just you know usually a difference or something. And uh, so this is true, but you, you have to put an H factor probably in, on this side here. Well, H is just you can put it on either side. I mean, you divide, H take out a, the H from here, and H is just some fixed set yeah, at the beginning, but, right? See, we're thinking of. Doing a Dantzig on the operator right, yeah, equation, yeah. so we want to write down this model at a finite right. stage and understand it, and then we'll let the h go to zero mm -hmm. and hope for best. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, oh, so, and, and, and see, it was nice to have it here because now you see when h is really small, right. and these have order one. Yeah. In fact. Uh, You know, every smooth function, you get down to find a scale, it will look pretty good at the scale h. Mm. It's linear, mm. and then, you know, maybe this goes away or something. I don't know, if these are bounded, then h is very small, then this is small. Mm -hmm. so you can... Okay. Uh, Oh yeah, so we're going to so indicate the picture of this because this is uh, the kernel is very important in this fluid motion. In fact, it's the key. The problem was completely mathematical problem was completely analyzed in the twenties uh, based on the fact that uh, the kernel is literally invariant. You know, when you look see the squirrels and water moving along with the flow. The, the rotation is the curl, and it's just moved along with the plug. So this, that's one of the mantras. Uh, but I wanted to just give the picture of this one. So, and, and you can check this one yourself. It's, it's nice to do that one too. I don't care if I run out of time. <laughs> so, it's nice. I'll do that too. So if you have a lot of coefficient here, uh, first of all, you can choose the orientation so the coefficients are either zero. I mean, if, if coefficients are zero, forget it. If they're non-zero, choose the orientation so that the coefficient is positive. Mm -hmm. And then you have a coefficient here. And then let's just say we have C prime here, and then maybe there's one going in here. Another one going in here that has a coefficient, and then one coming out here. Let's just keep it democratic. So you'd have coefficients like that. Then the boundary operator is um, the boundary operator is just. Oh, yeah, you gotta say what the coefficient is. To see, uh, the boundary operator will take this D and just move it to here. Mm -hmm. It'll take this C and move it to here and change its sign because this is this is it. let's let's say ingoing is has gets the positive sign and outgoing when we push it here gets the negative sign. Mm -hmm. So this boundary is zero if and only if the sum of the outgoing coefficients, the sum of the ingoing coefficients, this one, this mm -hmm. one. Is equal to the sum of the, the sum of the outside yeah. ones, and there's also that's a C triple prime. Yeah. So that, and then and then otherwise the boundary given to this coefficient, whatever this excess is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you, and the divergence uh, mm -hmm. is doing the same thing. It's measuring the, the way in which the input flow and the output flow don't mm -hmm. match. And if you actually go through the definitions, you can just think of it as the sum of this difference minus that difference. Mm -hmm. Just 
organize the sixfold sum into these three sums, mm -hmm. and that'll be your, your divergence, which is three differences. So that'll show that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the, uh, the curl one is, well, the, so what is, what is the, so the boundary is clear. Uh, the, the boundary is, the boundary, let me just, I'm going backwards when I talk about it. So the boundary of an edge is this point, with a plus orientation, a plus sign, and this point with a minus sign. Mm -hmm. So that's what the boundary is. So C times it will be C times this minus C times that. Mm -hmm. And the boundary of a face is uh, the sum of these oriented edges. Right. This has a coefficient, so this coefficient goes over to the edge. And if, if the orientation is like this, then it goes over to that and that and that and that. Mm -hmm. So if this is A, the boundary of this will be an A on this, an A on this, an A on this, an A on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, <clears throat> the co-boundary is sort of the opposite. So the co-boundary, like the co-boundary of a point, is are all the edges coming out of the point. So uh, I guess I would... This is a minus point, and probably looks like that. And so whatever coefficient you put here, you have to put on all these. That's what the co-boundary does. So the opposite of seeing what accumulates on the boundary is the adjoint. And so we know the boundary of this, and so uh, the co-boundary of so we're going to discuss now the co-boundary of an edge. He doesn't like homology theory, so I'm going to give it, I'm giving a course in homology <laughs> just for you. <laughs> See, you're trapped there. <laughs> you don't have to pay attention. <laughs> so I want to look at all of the faces that have this edge in its boundary. That's what the co-boundary of the edge is. It's all the, it's all the co-faces. So how many are, are there? Ladders. How many? Hold, you can hold up your straight fingers. How many faces touch an edge? What? You're calling on me. You, you did it. Oh, did only, it. Uh, okay, there's an answer. Four. Uh, four. Four. Because yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> four faces, right? Yeah. All right, so those are the four faces. Mm -hmm. And what will the co-boundary do? We'll take this coefficient here, associated to that edge, pointing in that direction, and we'll push it in, mm -hmm. and it'll attach it to that, right. to that. And this one gets pushed in like that. Mm -hmm. This one gets pushed in like that. And this one gets pushed in like that. So that's the co-boundary of that basic edge, and these generate the space, so by linearity, and that's the co-boundary operator. From from two to what does that go? From one to two. That that's mm -hmm. telling you what the co-boundary from B to. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're we're going to try to define the combinatorial curl here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the main piece of it. Then we have to use the point as well. But now, uh, but this is not the only place. This this is an arbitrary element here. So it has. It ha also has some coefficient b on this one, and some coefficient c on this one, and some coefficient d on that one. Right. So each of these, so the co-boundary of this total guy with numbers all over the edges, will attach to this single edge these four pieces, mm -hmm. because four edges contribute to the co-boundary value on that edge. Mm -hmm. Just like six edges contribute to and you see this uh, if you think of this vector field as kind of like a flow and it's really flowing in those directions these numbers are all positive just to find what you think of it that way otherwise it's a translation then this number represents the total amount of flow that's mm -hmm. going around in this direction <clears throat> the circulation of the vector field around this disk 
which that's one of the theorems of differential geometry. You <coughs> curl of a vector field and integrate it over something, you get the circulation around mm -hmm. the boundary of the something. So it looks like the curl. But you really, if you want to think of the curl as a vector field, uh, this is now in V2. I want it to be in V1. Mm -hmm. Christina? 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 Christina. Who's Christiana? Some queen or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> Danish. Oh, Danish queen? Danish. Yeah. Oh, Danish person. <laughs> so star goes into V back into V of 1, and, it, and then I'm saying this composition here is like a curl. Right. Okay, now what does star do? Remember? Star takes a face and associates it to a, the orthogonal face. Oh, right, okay. Right? Right. But uh, it'll be uh, the uh, dual decomposition. Mm -hmm. So it's, it goes up halfway here and down ha halfway here. Right. So it's like in the Z direction. So you have this turning in this direction and uh, mm -hmm. it becomes this you know, right hand rule or something. Okay, so that's kind of a halfway proof, mm -hmm. kind of a proof that this formula is correct. That you take the combinatorial versions of these things and, and uh, reinterpret them over here and get that. So you have this little world. See, this is a linear world here, mm -hmm. and everything's kind of worked out perfect. Uh, and then here's the non, the non linear world we had there in this extra term. Mm -hmm. Remember? So the non linear part doesn't work perfect. Mm -hmm. so, so now I wanted to. So the idea now is. Well, Looking for my notes before, I found this other piece of paper in my wallet <laughs> from a long time ago, maybe not too long ago, but I feel like I'm quoting Scott. <laughs> so I have written here, from scratch, what can we trust? <laughs> you know, and then I wrote down some truisms that we could trust. So, see, we're making a model. So we imagine we have a fluid, and maybe it's running through this body-centered cubic lattice, and we want to extract some information from it, and then use these operations and even product maybe to write a combinatorial analog of the um, the fluid evolution that we know at the continuum level has a certain form. Mm -hmm. And every paper you pick up in the journal of fluid mechanics will have, or many other journals, will write out this equation in various ways. They're all, they usually write more or less the same, but they're, sometimes they, they vary. And uh, then they might take the equation and uh, truncate it down in some way using this, these type of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when, when can you trust it? Well, a good way to test it is just to run simulations. Uh, Scott and an undergraduate at Stony Brook are uh, trying to set up things so we can run simulations on this model we're talking about today. Uh, and you can see if it looks good. But how would you know it's supposed to look good? Uh, and so what happens that's the reason I put that on the board with the error term there is suppose somebody gave one version of the equation and then somebody else started changing variables and calculating around and during this manipulation he used the Leibniz rule mm -hmm. for a product. Then he's going to get a new form of the equation and then he's going to give it to his engineer or something and he's going to do a finitation of it. It's just not going to, it's going to be different because the, at the combinatorial level, there's that other term there. You see what I mean? And almost every step of 
the usual manipulation of calculus. Some of them work and some don't. So as soon as you use a step that's not literally true at the combinatorial level, you're doing a different problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it may work, it may be the errors, but since there's this gap between the knowledge, between what you can control and what you need, and what you know you can control, what you need to control, you're out of mm -hmm. luck. So then you just, it's like shooting dice. Mm -hmm. So, what can you trust? So, so uh, now there's one funny form of writing the equation. I always thought it was funny because it didn't fit with topology. Uh, so that, you know, when something fits with topology, it feels more robust because you're not using the, the, the Gary's or the metric to understand it. So, but, uh, but that was one, that was the, the form I'm going to talk about it was used by Leray in a famous paper in 34. And actually, the epistemology of this equation is Leray plus 5 or 10 percent. That's generous. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not blue, it's 34 very much mm -hmm. in 3D. So, uh, and, and so what that is, is uh, if you, it's, it's, it's a topological derivation. So I want to talk about incompressible, so the divergence of the velocity fields can be zero, and it's something evolving in time. And, um, and the form of the equation is, is that okay? DBDT? Mm -hmm. That's okay? That's not okay. <laughs> okay? It's going to be some, this is the, the villain here, mm -hmm. there's something here, and then this something here, which is a villain, is not volume preserving, so you add a, a gradient term of some potential function to make it volume preserving. And then if you allow friction, and um, there's a, a nice argument in like Landau Lipschitz and so on, uh, using symmetry and the assumption that the fluid responds linearly to a strain times some coefficient. Uh, then you have some other term here, which is just the heat equation term of minus some viscosity coefficient times the tossing V. So this takes care of the friction, and uh, mm -hmm. this is the devil, and then the devil is corrected a little bit with this gradient term to make it volume preserving, and that's the form of the equation. Now, what's the devil? There's a lot of ways to write it when you start using uh, all the beautiful algebra of differential forms or vector field, vector calculus dimension three. A lot of ways to write this, and then this sometimes will change. Uh, it's kind of a gradient sometimes. So, but okay. So, so the idea is to. Uh, uh, Look at the physical derivation. Look at the derivation of this equation. What it, how, how this term is uh, arrived at. Uh, and, uh, and watch it. And then just before they take the calculus limit, stop, let the cubes don't, you can do, you know, everything is doing little cubes. Don't let the cubes become arbitrarily small, just let them be a small, mm -hmm. and just write down what you have at that point, or some natural approximation at that point, like a linear step. And that's, that's going to be the lattice, using this cubical body center cube lattice. And I just want to say what the idea is, and that is the idea to derive this uh, call it the Leray form, and that's not historically accurate. By the way, he called it the Stoke, uh, or the Navier equation. Navier, yeah, Navier. He called it the Navier equation. Yeah. Navier Stokes. Uh, Stokes is a linear version, I guess, in history. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, so what, what you do is, so it's going to use, so here's this tautology. If you have any intensive quantity, 
and you want to know d dt of your intensity quantity, then it's equal to, this is a tautology, it's the rate at which it brought in, in some region, the rate at, so the amount of this intensity quantity in this region is the amount, the rate at which it crosses the frontier, the net rate, some goes in, some goes out, plus the amount of, that's created in the region. So that's the rate of change of the intensity quantity. That's going to be the, and I'm going to take the intensity quantity to be the, the momentum. And it's going to be volume preserving, so I can imagine there's a uniform density everywhere, and then I have all these, imagine all these little particles going, this one's moving that way, this one's moving that way, this one's moving that way. They're uniformly distributed, but they all have this momentum. And then you have them all, and then think of this continuum emergence, they're all around here, and then instantaneously, some will be going out, and some will be going in. If you just do the mass, the amount of mass that goes out and the amount of mass that goes in, if there's no creation of mass or destruction of mass inside, it has to be equal to zero. I mean, that's e equal, out equals in. But if it's, uh, but now it's slightly different. So what this is the momentum means this, uh, let's see, we have some stuff going like that. Well, that's sort of coming out. The amount that's coming out the speed at which it's coming out is at this point is roughly the normal component, which is too too long. The normal component of this vector. That's the speed at which these points are moving out. But then they're actually not, but you have to take that normal component and multiply it by the V itself, because the momentum moves to there. So the momentum is moving out by that consideration. So Anyway, the integral of the normal component of this around here, the integral of the normal component of, it turns out it's this quantity V tensor V, which is the matrix V I V J. Just make this matrix. If you have a vector, make the three by three matrix out of these entries like that. That's a, see all the rows are gonna be V1, V2, V3 times V1, V1, V2, V3 times V2, and V1, V2, V3 times V3. So this is a rank one matrix, they're all proportional, right? And, uh, and this is a projection operator and it's quadratic and, and this and so on. So anyway, you can, now, I have to skip a lot, skip some steps. So anyway, in, I, I'm not making a fully logical story here. I'm going to start with a, a lattice vector field. I can think of it this way, or I can think of that way, and then do these manipulations. But I'm going to end up with uh, eventually a, a vector on every face. I have to skip that step for time reasons. And then I'm going to compute six-fold sum of, oh wait, I'm jumping from the, oh yeah, let's skip this step too. I'm jumping from, yeah, so keep both of those things in mind. Raise this. So if, if you do the continuum version and write, so it's an in integral of a normal derivative of something, and that's equal to the integral over the interior of the divergence of the mm -hmm. something. That's the Stokes theorem, the mm -hmm. integral of something in normal derivative. And then you imagine, and then you imagine taking a limit where this goes down small, and then you get that this term here is the divergence of B tensor B. Mm -hmm. That's what that nonlinear term is. B tensor B is this tensor here. Mm -hmm. And the divergence means you take the divergence of each row, and that gives you a vector. That's the method. And then this thing is not divergence free itself, and so you have to solve for P. Divergence of gradient of P is divergence of this, and then you convert that to Posse inverse. You get the formula for P, and then you the on. So instead of, so that's the calculus limit. Well, don't do the calculus limit. Imagine you have cubes, and then just take this lattice vector field and then make the same computation of the uh, net transfer and then 
put that down here, this combinatorial version, you put the, the analog, so that the momentum transfer across here, and uh, write that tautology down, put this gradient in to make the volume preserving. This involves Laplacian inverse, which Laplacian, we know what to write, but the combinatorial Laplacian is uh, root del plus del d. Mm -hmm. Heard it on what I have to do here. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you can write this down, you can write this down. So anyway, that would be the lattice model of, of an ODE. Well, not quite. That would be an ODE, the combinatorial version. Mm -hmm. But now I feel this is correct in the sense that this is the same thing, except I've just let the cubes be very small. So if I let the cubes get smaller and smaller, if I took my smooth functions here and restricted them to the lattice, this computation would clearly converge to that computation. So it will be consistent. So I feel I can trust this. And I came upon this a long time ago and I threw it away. I was starting from this end and just discretizing. I couldn't show anything about this form. And some of the other forms I could show things about. But I can't trust them. So, I, so anyway, so. So we're going to compute this thing. So, let's see. Uh, so, so the idea is to take a trustworthy derivation of this equation and stop the derivation just before you take the calculus limit. That's the idea for generating a combinatorial version. Mm -hmm. okay. And then you manipulate it how you can using the calculus mm -hmm. that you have here, where you have these extra terms, these quadratic terms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm try to prove something. Uh, last sentence here. Conclusion. So I'm saying the rest of my talk is, so to speak, under construction. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Make the shape as different, like hexagon or things like that, other than cube. Uh, well, hexagon's a planar figure. Um, I guess either. Either okay. way. You can, I guess, use one of the platonic solids. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't fill space with too many of those. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, most of these ideas work, uh, most aspects of it, but no, there, see, there were two places where I used the cubicle. Yeah. You know, I got this isomorphism here, there were six things here, yeah. and you know, they would fit the mass balance, and then there was this duality, though that's always true. You can always take the thing plus the dual. Can you do a tetrahedron? <laughs> yeah, I can't. Uh, let's say I can only do this one with the discussion I just gave. Yeah. Because I naturally get into the dual. Yeah. And I have this this star operator here. Mm. So, but you know, after all, we're just trying to understand this calculus equation, and so little boxes are. Be natural dx dy dz, but of course, in this general program, you would like to this discrete and continuous. You'd like to have general decompositions. Yeah. So, just for this particular problem, I kind of decided this is the one. This is it or nothing. <laughs> I mean, there's one other one which is sort of interesting. You you. Um, or cubes. You, you, um, you start nubbing the cubes. Mm -hmm. What do you get when you nub all the cubes? What is this little shape here? Mm -hmm. You see? R and C. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. huh? 
He's octagon, right? Or, yeah, He's right. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. octo is the word. Yeah, yeah right. Octahedron, yes, thank you. Yeah. Octahedron. I'm thinking it too, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. just blanking on the dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see a little octahedron yeah. there, right. and then you can see one here. Yeah. And then you can let them get bigger and bigger mm -hmm. until they touch. Yeah. And then you go even, that's halfway, and then you go even further. Mm -hmm. When they touch, they push against each other, then the two, these two points will flatten out into squares. Mm -hmm. The octahedron has, what, eight sides? Yeah. Octahedron. Yeah. And six vertices, top, right. bottom, four yeah. round. So now, when you push them together like that, you get six little squares, right. and when you push them all together, and then from top, bottom, side, from back. And the, and the eight faces, that, now when you nub the, uh, each face becomes a hexagon. So you have six squares and eight hexagons. Right. And uh, if you keep doing that, you just go like a third of the way further, or sixth of the way, which is the total amount, I don't know, a symmetrical amount, mm. then, um, then that fills space well, then it turns out what's left inside the cube is exactly the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's this famous Kelvin right. solid. It's 14 sided. Yeah. And uh, right. I had this daughter who's actually an architect in New York now. So she's, she was showing great geometric promise. <laughs> it turned out that when she got to teenagers, wearing an ensemble with this sort of gray here and this sort of gray here, <laughs> and just the right something here was actually more. So she's an architect, which is per perfect <laughs> geometry. But so once when she was ten, but uh, we took all these little play out of Stony Brook. Took all these little play balls, made a bunch of play balls, and we just <clears throat> mashed them together. Right. Right. And then we sort of peeled them away, and then inside was this sort of flattened ball. Right. And I was trying to figure out what it was. And I count the side, I had 14 sides. Eh. All right. You know, <laughs> and uh, so, and she sort of said, you know, she cut off the corner, you know, she figured it out right. before me. So, 10, she was 10. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, that's that, that proposal. That's a beautiful decomposition, right. and the dual of it is a triangulation. Archimedean solids fill up space, and the dual decomposition of the triangulation. Now, can I say one more remark? Like, I could say once we were having beer, <laughs> Joseph, but you know, if you're having beer and you look at the film, foam in the beer bottle, it's a bunch of sort of flattened uh -huh. things, right? Because it's totally filled, so all the faces are roughly flat, right? Because the pressure is the same on both sides. And can you say anything universal about it? It's very complicated, of course. Well, it turns out, how many of them, how many of these things come together at an edge? You know, right? It's three, right? With 120 degree angles. So the dual simplex there, the dual thing there is a, and how many come together at a point? Four. So the, the theorem is, this is the only, this is the theorem of the class, this lecture. The theorem is, the dual of a soap film, no matter how complicated it is, is a triangulation. Mm -hmm. That's oh, precisely. Okay. Thank you. Since I did not answer his question, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you.